Welcome all. Thank Good you. Good morning. Joining the UK Chinese Society of Automotive Engineers uh, 2020 annual conference. I uh, hope you all can hear me well. Um, before we start, um, you can switch on the interpretation feature on Zoom by following the instructions uh, on the screen. Um, the speeches may be uh, delivered in either Chinese or English, um, so you be selected off for interpretation. You will hear the original sound, uh, and if you selected Chinese or English channel, you will only hear the language you have chosen. Uh, and for speakers, please um, turn off the interpretation when you speak. And um, today we will have many guest speakers from China, UK, uh, as well as other European countries. Uh, this annual conference, um, it's gonna be a forum, forum uh, that will gather many people to collaborate and to share their ideas around the future of uh, the automotive industry. Uh, I am Huai Yin Tao, uh, Secretary General and Vice President of the UK CSAE. Uh, and I'm a principal engineer at McLaren Automotive. Um, my co-host today is Ms. Cheryl Song, Vice President and um, Head of External Relations of the UK CSAE. And now I will hand over to her. Thank you, Huayin. Uh, I'm Shuru, um, the Vice President of UK CICAE, looking after external relations. I'm also a senior engineer in Ford Motor Company. Uh, we are pleased to have all of you joining this event and a special thanks to all the collaboration organizations, Gas School, Association of Chinese Professors, University of Birmingham, Association of Chinese Engineers of Automotive in France, Association of Chinese Mechanical and Electric Engineers in Germany, Promotion Association for Scientific and Technical Cooperation between Austria and China. Thank you very much. And a special thanks to our sponsors, Next page, please. Thank you. Um, Changeway Project Management, which is one of the biggest company and doing project management professor, professionals, PMP training, and the other corporate trainings. Uh, Jianling Motor Company, the well-known commercial vehicle manufacturer, GMC also have close relationship with Ford Motor Company, especially UK Technical Center. Uh, I was involved in some product development Combustion, a famous consultancy, um, expertise in after treatment techniques and emission fast response analyzer. The director, Dr. Mark Peckham, delivered a presentation about interest about uh, uh, about about this talk about transit emission in webinar organized by UK CSE before. If you are interested in that topic, the video of the webinar is available online. Thank you for supporting UK CIC 2020 and your conference. Uh, now we're going to the agenda. I think most of you already seen uh, most of the topic and most of the part of this agenda. I'm probably just going to introduce like two special networking events in, in this. In the first networking, which is about lunchtime in UK lunchtime, that will have three different rooms. We'll give you more information uh, a little bit later. And the sex, second networking is a virtual park. Now we welcome our president, Professor Ho Ming Xu, to share his thoughts with us. Thank you. Good morning. Do we see the guys, friends and ladies? And gentlemen, the weather behind me is what we will see today and hopefully will be with us for a long, long time, especially for the society. And two days away is the first anniversary of our society. And today we are honored to see so many important guests 
from both the UK and China to join us in attending this first annual conference and celebrating its anniversary. On behalf of the standing committee of the UK CSAE, I would like to give all of you a very big warm welcome. The UK CSAE is a non profit professional society, first initiated in 2002, and it was officially visited last year and inaugurated in the open ceremony in London on 2nd of November. So we currently have nearly 400 members covering the Chinese, Chinese origin people working and studying in the UK wide automotive companies and suppliers, research institutes and universities. All those who have such experience. The objective of society is to support our members in promoting the communications between the Chinese, British, and the international automotive colleagues, and to support and develop cooperation. Through our annual meeting like today, our webinar and WeChat platforms, we promote professional information exchange and networking between our members. The UK Automotive Technology Research and Development Program is moving rapidly towards Action, autonomy, sharing, and location. Technology and uh, policy stands in the UK concerning energy and the vehicles has a big impact on the auto industry in European countries and beyond. In the development process of advanced automotive technology, such as four modernizations of vehicles, the collaboration at the international level including between China and the UK, becomes ever more important and useful. Currently, many Chinese automotive groups like Shanghai Automotive, Chang'an, Geely, and many companies have technology centers in the UK. At the same time, many UK automotive industry companies, such as Jaguar Land Rover, Mali Powertrain, Ricardo, and so on, have also established their technology center in China. In addition, many of the commercially successful cars sold in China market were engineered in the UK. For example, a Ford Downton Center and the Whitley Jaguar Land Rover Center. And these centers have a diverse workforce working and shoulder to shoulder. Chinese automotive engineers in the UK such as members of our society, have a good education background and generally have good understanding of both the Chinese and UK automotive industry. They have played an important role in new vehicle technology development, as well as research, and will be a invaluable task force for the cooperation of China and Britain in the development of the automotive industry. I hope that through today's meeting, we will learn a great deal of new development information and create new opportunities for further collaboration and cooperation. I hope you will enjoy the meeting and find it useful as a springboard for the discussions in the future. Finally, my best wishes for you, all of you, in this challenging time with the current situation. And thank you again for coming to join us. Okay. All right. Thank you, Professor Xu. And um, today we have um, over 500 people registered for the event. And um, I can see many people joining us now. Uh, for those who have joined, you can select the interpretation feature on Zoom and select the language you uh, you want to uh, listen. And next will be the guest speeches. And the first guest speaker is um, Dr. Simon Duan, uh, who is also a committee member at uh, UKCSE. 
Uh, Dr. Doan provides support to UK and Chinese engineering companies. He forged uh, many successful partnerships and advised many companies uh, on their overseas strategies. Now, I hand over to you, Dr. Doan. Thank you, Dr. Tang. Um, uh, you can hear me, yeah? Okay. Yeah, all good. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. President, Professor Xu, Thank you for your invitation to me to speak at this conference. Distinguished guests, ladies, gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon. I'm honored to support UK CSAE annual conference held online this year. Year 2020 is a difficult year for most of us, but the collaboration between UK and China never stops. In two phone calls over recent months, Prime Minister Boris Johnson and President Xi Jinping both reaffirmed their commitment to deepening bilateral cooperation in trade, climate change, and global issues. Department for International Trade continues to support UK-China trade relationship. We promote win-win collaborations building on UK and Chinese strengths in innovation and industry. Together, we can tackle global challenges such as the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. COVID-19 showed the importance of our governments and companies working together. At the start of outbreak, UK firms such as AstraZeneca, GSK, HSBC, BP, and many others have donated medical equipment to China. As the pandemic spread to the UK, we helped bring millions of pieces of PPE and thousands of ventilators to the NHS from China. Our strong trade relationship undoubtedly saved lives over the past few months. The Chinese economy is bouncing back faster than most of the other countries and the UK-China commercial relationship in automotive sector is also growing steadily. As we enter the 2020s, we are in the midst of transport revolution. Over the next two decades, transport technology will change faster than at any time for more than a century. Cars powered by fossil fuels and internal combust engines will be replaced to large extent with electric and autonomous vehicles. The benefit of new energy vehicles in particular are deep and wide. They are in line with the ambitions that both the UK and Chinese government have for their people, i.e. to improve our air quality, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and to ensure cleaner and quieter cities for our citizens. Under such backdrop, the opportunities for suppliers as the automotive sector transforms to electrification are significant. The British government has made a long-term commitment to be at the forefront of the design, manufacturing, and adoption of zero emission vehicles. In addition to the comprehensive funding support for research, development, and industry launched earlier. In this July, UK government announced up to one billion automotive transformation fund to support the large scale industrialization of an electrified supply chain. My colleague from Advanced Propulsion Center, Julian Hetherington, will provide more information on this fund in his speech later on. In November 2020, we'll also see the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference, known as COP26, be held in Glasgow under the presidency of the UK government. Clean growth is one of the COP26 priorities and the transport is a major theme. The challenges and opportunities from the transition to clean transport adds great urgency to our discussions here today. The British government is determined to remain world leaders 
on decarbonizing road transport. But we know that doing so will mean working with partners globally, and especially China. China already has the biggest automotive market in the world and is innovating at an incredible pace. Some far-sighted major Chinese automakers, such as SAIC, Geely, Chang'an, NIO, and BYD, has already chosen the UK for their research development centers and R&D activities. Together, British and Chinese researchers will develop the next generation products and technology. I'm delighted to say that today we have representatives from UK and Chinese governments, as well as other stakeholders, industry representatives, leading academics of both countries. I'm sure all of us will benefit from our exchanges today. Ladies and gentlemen, the scale, the challenge, and opportunities ahead of us are vast. Only together, we can change the automotive industry create new models of growth for both our great nations and building a better world for all of our people. I wish you all great success in your important discussions today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dunn. That's a very clear picture for the two nations. Uh, and next we have Mr. David Gregory. Uh, David has spent a very long time in China and Southeast Asia as executive for multinational companies. And he aims to deliver clear and practical advices to clients to support their business with China. Now I hand over to you, Mr. Gregory. Thank you very much. Let me just set that up. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, can I offer some particular thanks for the opportunity to address the conference today and in particular to Professor Hongwing Shu for inviting me. Um, I am very aware that time is pressing, so I will get straight into my presentation. Uh, one second. Hmm, that's interesting, I cannot. Right, um, sorry, we have a little technical glitch there. Um, the China Britain Business Council uh, can trace its history back to the early 1950s, so over 60 years now. Um, during that period, obviously, the organization has existed under slightly different guises and um, different names. But we've been operating as we are now as the China Britain Business Council since 1998. Um, we're a not for profit uh, business membership organization, and our aim is to support British businesses who engage with China in terms of either trade or investment. We have uh, around 100 staff, um, the majority of which are based in China spread across a range of offices um, going from the north to the south and not just split by geography but we also split by sector and one of the sectors obviously that we have an interest in is transport. Um, we offer a range of services to our members and non-members and a snapshot of those services would for example include market research, identifying partners for companies to work with, and even retainer services, which allows British companies to actually put feet on the ground in China through our organization. Um, in what we do, we very much try and focus our efforts and reflect the interests of our members and respond to industry trends, hence our interest in the automotive sector. And I think Simon, Dwayne ahead of me outlined very clearly the importance of the UK and China in terms of automotive collaboration. And for several years now, we have been running regular activities um, around this theme. Uh, we have auto round tables. Um, we aim to run of two of these a year, uh, bringing together companies uh, from all aspects of the auto sector, for instance, including suppliers, 
OEMs, motorsport companies, companies involved in new NEVs and so on. The one common factor that they have is that they are in the sector and doing business either in China or with China and or sorry, or planning on doing so. So basically, we're pervasive, providing a platform uh, for companies to exchange and share knowledge uh, and build up connections in a non-competitive environment. Um, we aim to put out about four newsletters a year. Um, these are very much, I would say, general light touch reading, um, aiming to keep our members and network updated with news and any specific issues of interest. So for instance, at the moment, uh, what is obviously a very interesting topic is the resurgence of, um, of sales activity in the auto market in China. And uh, ideally, every year, we like to um, culminate with uh, a physical event, um, ideally a physical mission to China. Um, in 2019, we took a number of company representatives on a mission uh, centered around Auto Mechanica in Shanghai. Obviously, 2020 in the current circumstances is proving somewhat difficult due to the global pandemic, but we hope to have that re-established and back on track in 2021. So what I've just been describing is the regular activities we have around the sector. Um, and this slide really touches on um, the areas that we focus on um, for those activities. In other words, the areas of interest to us and our members. So these include um, new materials, um, and obviously there is a high demand for high, more high performance, more lightweight solutions um, for the vehicles that we will be producing in the future. Um, obviously technologies around intelligent and connected vehicles. Um, what is also coming up um, more and more is the after sales market um, as the so I say the age of cars in China starts to grow. We're currently only about five years old, but there is an increasing market for, for um, pre-owned vehicles. And that's creating very good opportunities in all sorts of areas, including the opportunity for uh, UK companies to get involved in the supply of spares and parts. And of course, new electric vehicles. So that was... Um, a very brief snapshot, and excuse me, but I say because of the time constraints of CBBC's activities and interest um, and what we do in relation to the automotive sector. Um, I hope something of that is of interest to people out there. And uh, if anybody in the audience would like to have a direct discussion about something specific, I would be very happy to take that up. And I'm sure that you will be able to reach me through um, UK CSE AE. So many thanks for your time and um, yes, good luck for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, next we have Mr. Julian Hetherington, uh, who is responsible for automotive trans uh, transformation and technology trends at APC. Uh, Julian joined the APC in 2019 after 31 years in the industry at Ford and Jaguar Land Rover. Now, um, hand it over to you, uh, Julian. We have your slides. Thank you very much. If you wouldn't mind going to the first slide, please. So good morning my, or good evening. My name is Julian Hetherington. I'm Automotive Transformation Director at the Advanced Propulsion Centre. And we're based in the University of Warwick campus in Coventry. We're a not-for-profit organisation that was established in 2013 and sponsored by the Automotive Council and BASE, that's the Government Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And our mission is to support projects that deliver CO2 benefits and create employment through the advancement of in-vehicle propulsion technologies, recognising that the transport sector accounts for around 28% of CO2 emissions. Over the first six years, we've invested over a billion pounds in 130 APC projects, funded, matched by industry, and they've delivered over 180 million tonnes of CO2 savings and created or safeguarded over 40,000 jobs in the UK. We've worked with over 290 partners in various consortia, and through our extensive network and industry understanding, we provided project support and guidance in addition to grant funding. 
So I'd just like to set out the UK's electrification ambition, but start with some foundations of where we are today. The UK has a significant and strategically important automotive industry, as we know, and it directly employs over 160,000 people in manufacturing and probably 800,000 or more in the wider life cycle. We have strong capability in powertrain and expect around 60,000 people involved in internal combustion engine manufacturing and drive life. And that supports our strong export position of about 1.2 million engines. And about 80% of our finished vehicle production is exported to over 160 countries worldwide. The UK therefore has a global role in satisfying the ambitions of decarbonising transport. And I'm glad to say that we have cohesive and strong domestic policy to support this journey. We have very strong R&D commitment and great integration with universities and research and technology organisations that support fundamental research and later development. And we also recognise the challenge of life cycle analysis and have made great progress in decarbonising our electricity power supplies. And this is vital in reducing the impacts of both manufacture and use of electrified vehicles. Next slide, please. Of course, understanding the demand picture is vital, not only for the tier one system suppliers to the car makers, but also upstream in the supply chain. There is a cohesive set of policies that is driving electrification in the UK, but in no small part because of our export performance for finished vehicles, that stroke growth is strong uh, and growth around the globe is a major factor. Even if we assume very conservative levels of electric vehicle penetration, we can see there is significant demand for batteries, for example, by 2040. And to put things in perspective, that's around 100 times the scale of battery manufacturing capacity that existed in the UK in 2019. Quite massive growth. If anything, we expect this curve will accelerate more steeply after this short hiatus from the current global crisis. And many markets, and the UK especially, are focusing on green growth recovery policies, and the transport sector is a prime target. So the opportunity and the demand is there for investment in these technology areas and the supply chains in the UK. And it's coming very fast. Next slide, please. We recognise that any in-vehicle systems have a long upstream supply chain. And to make the industry competitive, we need an equally competitive supply chain right the way through to raw materials. And I mean competitive not only on cost, but also security and resilience of these extended supply chains. And it's clear that as demand grows, some of these materials may be competed for across the globe. So we need to develop agile, robust supply chains and make long-term agreements. The scale of this opportunity for the UK is significant. And we've recently published a report that highlights many of these opportunities and also serves to inform our programme of support, focusing on the best opportunities for the UK and filling the strategically important areas of these critical supply chains. Next slide, please. The UK government has demonstrated significant commitment to advancement in this industry over the years. Through involvement in the Automotive Council from 2009, a wide spectrum of programmes have been funded that have helped advancements in manufacturing processes, vehicle technologies, connectivity, autonomy, infrastructure such as charging and data networks, and an immense focus on decarbonising propulsion systems. And this focus is in line with the UK's ambitions on net zero and supports the grand challenges of clean growth and the future of mobility. And we should recognise that automotive sector developments, particularly perhaps on cost and technology deployment at scale, often have very significant benefits that spill over into other sectors and crucially have significant leverage on the upstream supply chain for materials. Next slide, please. 
This summer, as Simon mentioned, we launched the Automotive Transformation Fund. This is a fund designed to form the last part of that bridge from research and development into industrialization, manufacture at scale. A programme that can provide support for investors in the key electrified vehicle technology areas of batteries, fuel cells, motors, drives and power electronics, and crucially, their upstream supply chains, as this is where global competitiveness will be supported. This is an opportunity to, between us, design from the ground up, really cost effective, resilient, end-to-end -end supply chains for these new technology areas. This fund is accessed through the Advanced Propulsion Centre and we've already started to support over 30 feasibility studies considering larger scale projects and have received a number of significant expressions of interest for large scale projects with a total investment so far in the first few months of over three billion pounds. We recognise that there is a significant shift in the industry and the tipping point is coming at us fast. And that inevitably brings great opportunities, but also some risk. Our aim is to help mitigate some of those risks and accelerate this remarkable transition. I've had nearly 35 years in this industry and frankly, this is the most exciting period I can remember with change, opportunity and challenge in equal measure. We are here to help. So if you'd like to join us on this great adventure, just please get in touch. You'll find all of our details, my contact details on our website. Thank you for your time. It's a pleasure to join you today. And I know this is going to be a great day. Thank you, Julian. News. And next we have Mr. Sunan Jiang, uh, Minister Councillor for Science and Technology Affairs at the Embassy of the Republic of China in the UK. Okay. Distinguished guests, it is a real delight to join you at this uh, annual conference. First, on behalf of the Chinese Embassy in the UK, I would like to extend my warm congratulations to the event and express my respect to the people both from China and the UK who have for years support and the promote cooperation between China and the UK. COVID-19 pandemic has been ranging around the world for months. As we fighting against virus together, we have uh, deeply realized significance of the conception of a community with a shared future for mankind. We had a deep understanding of the leading role of science, technology, and innovation shot in SDI. International cooperation is the choice to beat the virus. China and the UK show solid foundation for STI cooperation, like Simon mentioned. In, 19, in 2017, China and the UK joined the least strategy for STI cooperation. Last year, for the first time, STI was included in China-UK EFD, Economics and the Financial Dialogue. China and the UK are highly complementary and uh, have a great potential for cooperation. UK has been uh, playing a leading role in the field of uh, basic research with a strength in the original innovation and the ranking first in the scientific research output per staff, per researcher. With a strength in R&D technology and the unique advantage in automobile, automobiles, UK has produced a series of well-known brands of cars. In China, research activities in STI have been dynamic, ranking 14th in global innovation index of a wide pole. China has uh, rich uh, talents and uh, opportunities for development and a huge market demand. The innovation driven development strategy of China also provide uh, opportunities for UK. President Xi announced that at UN conference that China will achieve carbon neutrality by 2016, which opened up a broad space 
for green development, including the new energy vehicle, it is evident that cooperation with China is an opportunity for the UK. As a major producing and consume country of uh, automobiles, the annual sales of ownership of a new energy vehicle in China has ranking number one in the world for consecutively years, account for half of the world, world's total volume. Since the beginning of this year, affected by the pandemic and the changes in Chinese new energy vehicle subsidies policy, sales of a new energy vehicle in China goes down, but still is one of the world's largest consumed countries. China's huge market has given some international car manufacturer tremendous opportunities for development. The pandemic has caused the global car market to strengthen and the sales in the decrease rapidly. However, driven by the lack of recovery of the Chinese market, auto companies like Toyota, BMW, Mercedes, Audi has been increased of their business in China. For more than half a year in 2020, Tesla ranking first in sales of a new energy vehicle in China, which help of the Chinese market is market value increased by more than times in year. In Paris, new STI will bring new opportunities to the development of uh, auto industry, which calls for stronger cooperation between countries. The topic of this event, digitalization new energy vehicle is great. Looking to the future, China has great potential for cooperation in the auto industry with many countries, including UK, strengthening and the cooperation in China in the field of new energy vehicle in particularly offers a new development opportunity for auto companies from all over the world, of course, including the universities. I hope that universities and the companies of China and the UK will seek opportunities for cooperation and strengthening innovation and research in new technology for produce smarter, cleaner, and more electric and connected automobiles. At the same time, auto parts supplies from different countries also have a great potential for development in the new energy vehicle market of China. This event provides a good opportunity for China-UK women cooperation. All countries need to unite and cooperate to address the global challenge facing the human society. The Chinese embassy in the UK will continue to support STI cooperation between China and the UK. Hope everyone will make the best of the opportunity of this event to further enhance mutual understanding and the trust and the create a mutual benefit and the win-win development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Jiang. Uh, next, we have Mr. Chris Mason, uh, who's CEO of Suzita. And uh, today we actually have a video from Chris and his team. Hello, good morning to you all and welcome to this UK China SAE conference. My name, for those of you that aren't familiar with me, is Chris Mason and I'm fortunate enough to be the Chief Executive Officer of Fasita the international membership organization for the automotive and mobility systems engineering community. I've been asked by uh, our good friend, uh, Professor Ju to come along and, and talk about FACITA and the evolving technical landscape. It's emerging from the traditional uh, automotive uh, uh, sector. Uh, and of course, it's, it's my pleasure and honor to do so. So with regard to FACITA, our organization has been in existence for 70 years this year uh, and has survived this long because our originators had a great vision and great strategy uh, for what you engineers uh, are looking for. And that's to be with each other uh, in support of your pursuit to progress next generation technology. So from our international congresses to our summits, to our closed door, uh, technical uh, discussions, 
uh, we develop outcomes that the engineering community values. But most of all, I believe the engineering community values uh, the ability that FACITA provides as a platform to bring international engineers together with their peers to generate share knowledge uh, and contribute and gain from thought leadership in uh, equal measure. So it's a successful formula that's lasted many, many years uh, and will continue to deliver uh, in the same shape and form, uh, although in a more modern setting uh, as we go forward over the next, I hope, 70 years. Now, of course, the technological landscape is changing and has changed within Facita's life, let alone my lifetime. Uh, I'm proud to say that I've been in the automotive industry now for 35 years this last summer, uh, so half the time that Facita has been in existence. But both organisation and myself have seen technological changes uh, that mean the industry is a completely different place to when we both began in it. From the Facita perspective, back to a time where the early advances in, in technology were seeing uh, the uh, highways and motorways uh, being opened up to all mankind, bringing social and professional um, uh, movement for people that change lives, change businesses, change the way we live, change the way we exist. And of course the, the success and the, the tireless and continued aspiration of the consumer for more automobile based technology means we face some challenges today that could never have been foreseen all those years ago. We all know what the challenges are, uh, but guess what? We all know where the solutions will come from, from you guys, from our engineers, from the people who work on solutions that will come to the fore for the consumer in 10 or 15 or 20 years time, addressing problems of congestion, of uh, environmental impact, uh, and critically of, of safety and the business model uh, through technology. We know that through the mobility agenda and the technology of mobility and connectivity, we know that these things will be addressed uh, forevermore. And that's a wonderfully exciting uh, prospect for the engineering community of today. Because, of course, solutions lie uh, in every uh, discussion and every consideration uh, that we have. So consider yourselves to be the providers uh, of the, the future uh, of transportation that addresses some of the problems today. And from our part, FACITA will support you in doing that. We're having discussions with our colleagues at uh, UK China SAE uh, about uh, how the organisation can come into the FACITA community and contribute and gain from the value add that that will bring in the same way that China SAE has done for many, many years to come. Uh, and I look forward to uh, welcoming you guys into the community uh, and uh, I look forward to seeing much, much more of you as we do so. So next time we speak, maybe it can be in person. Uh, we hope that that will be the case. But in any event, the Facita door is opening to UK China SAE and I encourage you to take advantage of that and take advantage of the exciting opportunities that the technology of mobility is bringing to you all. And from me, uh, I'll leave it there from today. I look forward to perhaps a more detailed presentation with you at some point in the future. But do uh, take advantage of today's learning, take advantage of the community that it brings to you, and take advantage of the opportunity that our wonderful, wonderful industry will bring for you uh, over the course of your career. I look forward to uh, hearing and speaking with you all again soon. Uh, enjoy your day and keep everybody safe and well. All the best. Hello. Yeah, that was good um, working with Fazita. And in addition to Fazita, we also have uh, Professor Jun Li, uh, President of China SAE. Uh, however, due to personal circumstances, um, Secretary General Xu Ming Zhang uh, will speak on behalf of uh, Professor Li. Uh, now, Mr. Zhang, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's Xu Ming Zhang from China SAE. Thanks for the invitation uh, by Professor Xu. Uh, on behalf of China SAE and especially by, uh, on behalf of uh, Professor Li, um, I'm uh, I can congratulate to the anniversary of the uh, UK Chinese uh, SAE. 
Um, I'm glad to be here uh, with you, uh, with you, the, the players from the global industry. China SE is a nonprofit organization for auto engineers, and we are the member of the CETA. Uh, so I'm work closely with Chris, who just spoke. Uh, by promoting technology innovation, China SE work closely with industry, university, and the government agencies. This week, indeed, we just finished our annual conference uh, and exhibition in Shanghai. We launched the techno uh, technology roadmap for energy efficient and the new energy vehicles. The key targets set in the roadmap, including carbon emission, uh, will peak in 2028 in for auto industry, and the new energy vehicles uh, sales will reach 50% of the total uh, new vehicle market in 2035. So this kind of strategic, uh, strategic study uh, by or, or, or organized by China SAE will be the key uh, reference to the government for the policy making and uh, the companies for their technology and the product planning. So China, China SAE work closely with the global players. We understand cooperation is the key for OEM and suppliers in the auto, in the auto, auto industry and also key for the auto industry with other industries like power, uh, IT, um, artificial intelligence, uh, transport, uh, transport, and city planning to address the challenge of the energy, environment, and traffic uh, congestion and safety. It's more beyond the power of a single industry, just like auto, uh, to uh, work uh, towards a sustainable mobility. So indeed, end of September in last month, uh, on the what a new energy vehicle congress hosted by uh, China SAE, we invited the global stakeholders in auto industry, and uh, we reached some kind of con uh, consensus that by 2035, 50% will uh, the, the auto uh, industry will be new energy vehicles. The same to the technology map I just mentioned and the new energy vehicles will be of competence in 2025. So this kind of a study, we, we work and, uh, in China and also with the global stakeholders. And in the future, we would be glad to work closely with you in the future on either uh, through the UK Chinese uh, SAE or some other uh, kind of uh, format. So thank you and uh, I hope the, the year and uh, uh, success and I look forward to work with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhang. And next, we will have a few um, technical presentations. Uh, and uh, we are going to have Mr. Michael Miller, uh, Vice President uh, of New Energy Vehicle at Ricardo Asia. Uh, morning, Michael. I know you have spent uh, 25 years in the energy vehicle development with global experience uh, from uh, all over the world and developing, developing NEV, working on uh, bus prototypes through to production for vehicles and uh, components, including battery emissions and inverters. These are very close to my uh, work as well. So yeah, very much looking forward to your um, speech. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I just to say hello to everybody and uh, hope everyone's staying safe and well today in this challenging times. Uh, I'm Mike Miller, as, as uh, Mr. Kang mentioned, uh, responsible for new energy vehicle development in uh, Ricardo for China. Uh, I worked in China for 10 years, but I'm now continuing to support our Chinese operations from our UK base. Now, thank you guys very much for the chance to speak today. Uh, just a quick Introduction for Ricardo. We are a global technical consulting company focused on clean technology, uh, continuing to develop low uh, emissions engines, which we've been doing for the, about 100 years now, or a little over 100 years, as well as leading the shift to electrified powertrains across the automotive industry. Now, automotive has been heading down a path for electric of electrification for some time now. But the confluence of the climate change crisis, people's demand for the cleaner air, and China's desire for energy independence has greatly increased the pressure on the clean transport. Now, this has begun in the passenger car market, but it's now also shifting into commercial vehicle, rail, off-highway applications, as well as stationary energy generation. There is 
a massive shift to the more efficient, renewable, lower polluting energy sources. And the primary direction and all of these clean energy sources have one thing in common, and that's electrification. Now, this is challenging the status quo and opening opportunities for many new players to emerge and forcing traditional uh, companies to adapt quickly. That's something that doesn't really come easily to them. That's something that they have to do in these times. Now, this is affecting OEMs and supply chains alike. And as the new technologies are, are developing, they're creating avenues for uh, disruptive approaches to shake up the industry. And we see this in emerging technologies like autonomy and connected vehicles, as well as the aggressive advancement we're seeing in older technologies like batteries and electric drive systems as they get adapted to uh, out of uh, stationary power and into powertrain applications. Now, First thing I want to talk about is the disruptive aspect of autonomous driving, uh, and it's coming to China quickly. Autonomy is signaling uh, the convergence of the information technologies uh, that we have all around us, as well as the transport of goods and people. Now, the level of connectivity and the data available in China, coupled with the investment of the infrastructure by the government and the culture of the people for adopting technology early, make it a very attractive place for progressing autonomy quickly. Uh, AI has made massive developments with, uh, with large amounts of data pro and processing available in, in China, and China is one of the world leaders in uh, artificial intelligence. And it's becoming a, a affordable for doing processing on vehicle as well as off vehicle. So we start to see the shift of uh, effort to move the, um, the work into the vehicle itself. So these decisions can be made uh, instantaneously at the, uh, in the vehicle. Now, we are seeing a shift of consolidation of these core processes in the vehicle into the single controllers, allow for data to be shared more readily across the vehicle and improvements into the wireless transmission uh, for things like 5G for getting more processing off vehicle. And this leads to highly complex systems that all need to work together cohesively and safely. There's a lot to do in this space still, uh, a lot of effort being put into the core technologies uh, with, with uh, the processing of the, the image and the decision making, but it still all comes down to the very complex systems that need to be uh, working together seamlessly. Now, I, this is certainly not a small task, and I believe that the bigger task is still not even fully understood uh, to make sure that we, it all works together. So autonomy is a, is a key area that is going to lead some of the aspects of the disruption of the, techno, of, the, of the automotive industry. Now, another area we're seeing massive advancement is in batteries. And, and some of the other speakers have already mentioned this, but batteries have been around for hundreds of years in some form or another. Uh, I should say some of the first batteries came out of the UK. Now, this kind of ingenuity from the UK still persists today with uh, leading advancements in the next phase of technology of batteries. Now, battery companies are on the rise uh, in the UK, uh, with coupled with massive gov government investments as well as research in the automotive-specific activities, as mentioned, the the billion-pound investments into the the uh, electrified uh, vehicle infrastructure. Um, now. The current lithium ion batteries are only around 300 watt hours per kilogram and cost at around $100 US dollars per kilowatt hour at this level. And it makes batteries reasonable for light duty automotive, uh, but still not cost effective or energy dense enough for medium or heavy duty applications or long term driving, uh, long distance driving. So we still look at the next advancement of batteries to, to be five to 10 years away, uh, and certainly looking at technologies like lithium sulfur, solid state batteries, or say lithium air. Uh, lithium air has been around for a long time, uh, always been some 10, 15 years away. It, hopefully it's getting a little bit closer now, but lithium air shows the energy density similar to that of a, of a uh, gasoline. Now, these are all strong contenders for a step change in the in battery evolution and the step change in the technology and how we're going to power our vehicles. And the last area I really want to focus on in my short speech here is about the rapid advancement of the electric drive system. 
Now, these are the, the engines, the new engines of the electrified vehicle. They're, they come in all different shapes and sizes, higher powers, compact sizes, uh, made possible by changes in, electro, in electromagnetics, as well as innovative uh, electronics, thermal and transmission systems. We expect the next generation of these systems are going to use multi-gears, uh, multi-speed gears to optimize the torque, higher switching frequencies, coupled with higher voltages and, and, and wide band gap semiconductors to minimize losses, and more complex cooling approaches uh, through direct cooling for things like uh, junctions and semiconductors or oil cooling directly onto machine windings. We're going to see massive improvements in the size and, and torque density of these machines in the, in the coming years. In summary, uh, China is one of the largest and currently most viable auto markets in the world, and it has its sights firmly set on a sharp turn to green mobility. China has made extensive investment in its capability uh, to, to do its development internally by itself, but can still benefit substantially with collaboration globally and especially with the UK. The UK has a long, proud history of the technological advancement in all these areas and is also investing billions of pounds into these technologies to ensure that the UK does stay at the forefront of these technologies. I'm confident a continued China-UK collaboration is going to be good for everybody. So if across the UK, and, and I'll have to say, especially at Ricardo, we are working tirelessly to try and advance the clean technologies in the UK and in China as we strive to create a world fit for the future. Thank you guys for the opportunity to speak. Uh, hopefully I've stayed within, uh, within my time. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you very much for the insights. And uh, next we have Dr. Mike Bassett from uh, Mana Powertrain UK. Uh, morning, Mike. And uh, I know you have joined Mana Powertrain in 2007, and you're currently head of research and responsible for global research activities focusing on both IC engines and electrified mobility. And I think these are going to be very interesting topics as well. I know you have a lot of experience on hybridization. Now, and over to you, Mike. Um, can you hear us, Mike? We can, can you, see your presentation. Hey, hey. Yeah. Can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, both. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. So good morning and good evening to those of you in China. And I'd like to thank Professor Chu for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I, I wanted to share a presentation looking at the potential role of plug-in hybrids um, in, in the short and, and medium term for um, passenger vehicles. We hear a lot about electrification and, and for sure that's the way the industry is moving. Um, but it's the, the timing that I think is, is important with these technologies. So. Um, I think we're all fairly familiar with this graph, which shows the CO2 emissions values um, normalized to NEDC for various markets around the world. And if we look at the EU, we see future legislative targets. 2030 is 59 grams per kilometer. And China also has laid out a roadmap that's uh, also very challenging by 2035. Fleet average um, tailpipe emissions need to be 46 grams per kilometer by, by 2035. So we need significant changes to the vehicle fleet pr propulsion mix over the next decade and, and beyond. And if we project these, um, these targets forward, we see that around 2045, zero tailpipe carbon dioxide emissions may be mandatory. And, and that leads us to conclude pure electric or, or fuel cell uh, vehicles by that time. And before that time, we're seeing various countries talk about uh, gasoline and diesel bans. The UK is talking about 2030, 2035 for, for banning such vehicles. So 
the CO2 targets are challenging and they're driving manufacturers towards increased electrification. And this maps out the, the kind of technology roadmap we need to adopt in, in this time frame. But this is still 15, 20 years away. And, and the other thing we ought to stop to consider as engineers is what's meant by zero with this legislation. If we look at a, a kind of complete picture of, of the uh, life cycle of a vehicle, the emissions regulations relate to the in-use phase, so when the vehicle is being driven. But as engineers, we ought to look at the complete picture. We ought to look at the embedded CO2 during vehicle production and also during the fuel production process and end of life and, and look at a holistic picture. And this is something I've um, applied a simple analysis to for a potential plug-in hybrid vehicle. So if we consider a, a, a typical 1400 kilogram vehicle over a 150,000 kilometer life, and assume that our vehicle can achieve 120 grams per kilometer CO2 over the NEDC. As we electrify that vehicle, we can apply the um, NEDC tailpipe weighting factor or the utility factor to assume that the longer the vehicle's electric driving range capability, the more gasoline will displace over its life. And we can account for the welter tank contribution of the fuel we use as well. And we can see that as we increase electric driving range, we think we'll use less gasoline, but we'll use more electricity. And I've used a, an EU grid mix from a couple of years ago for this analysis. And, and the, the analysis is quite sensitive to where you are. If you're, if you're in France, where energy is produced predominantly by nuclear power, then this is a much lower number. In other parts of the world where um, coal-fired power stations um, are most predominant, then, then this is a much higher cont contributor. And then we can look at the embedded CO2 in the vehicle battery to achieve the electric driving range as well, as well as the production of the conventional vehicle. And if we sum all of those things together, we see actually a minima in this curve of around 100 kilometers electric driving range for a plug-in, giving us the best life cycle footprint. And actually it's reasonably comparable to pure EVs based on the same analysis. And we can achieve with a, with a vehicle with unlimited autonomy by its conventional powertrain, an equivalent life cycle footprint to a vehicle with about a 200 to 300 um, kilometers EV range. So, what we need to be looking at is, is plug-in hybrid vehicles with longer autonomy, further autonomy than, than typically currently available. And another thing we can consider is that actually low carbon fuels significantly improve this picture by reducing the in-use phase when we use the gasoline engine. Um, and the technology we're using for conventional IC engines, so by displacing some of the battery of a pure BEV and using an IC engine, is also readily recyclable. Okay, I'll I'll stop there. I've got more, but I'll I'll stop there as I, I know we're tight for time. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. And uh, next we have uh, Mr. Mr. Mark O'Connor uh, from Cummins. And uh, Mark has been with Cummins for 20 years and worked in the global automotive industry for 30 years. He has served as general manager at Dongfeng Cummins Engine uh, and Cummins Turbo Technology Wuxi, uh, as well as uh, Asia Pacific leader for Cummins Futuration. Uh, Mark. Yes, uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, all good. Thank you. Professor Xu, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good, good afternoon to those in China. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to attend today's conference. Uh, may I also say thank you to Professor Campion from Bradford, who, who, gave, who uh, introduced me to Professor Xu. So really a big thank you to, to everybody involved. Um, I, as, you, as you mentioned, I spent seven years in China between 2005 and 2012 and continue to work closely with customers and colleagues in, in China today. Um, Cummins is, yeah, is, a, is a global company. 
with, with very significant presence in China and in the UK. So today is, is especially exciting for me. Uh, during my career, I've been fortunate to work and live on five continents. Um, my time in China was probably the most exciting um, and continues to play a big part in the way I think about business, future enterprise and technical innovation. So really looking forward to today's discussions and, and already um, some of the material that's been presented. At Cummins, we have a mission to make people's lives better by powering a more prosperous world and a strategy that aims to deliver value to all stakeholders. As many of you know, Cummins is a collection of complementary businesses. Our focus is on a unique combination of combustion engineering, emissions management and power technologies. And our strategy follows a stakeholder model underpinned by six elements. The first element being we need to lead in critical technologies and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, our second pivot is leveraging our global footprint. Cummins is a hundred year old company. Um, we've got a, a global network of, of significant technical and manufacturing centers. Our third pivot is to engage with market leading customers and partners. So it's fabulous to see many of you represented here today, as well as suppliers um, like Ricardo, um, Michael. Um, our fourth pivot is building market enterprise growth platforms. As we all know, technical advances often start with small innovations, which we then aim to build upon quickly to, to create a sustainable enterprise. The fifth pivot is focusing on the most demanding marketplace applications. This is where we can generate the most value. And then sixth, finally, once we've built that enterprise from that innovation, how do we quickly generate um, and maintain economies of scale and, and then perpetuate that, um, that, that global footprint? So, so back to, to uh, leading in critical technologies. Cummins leadership in the prime mover um, technology space is based on decades of research and development, as well as on, on insights into the solutions, services and products most critical to our customers success. The way we define technological leadership is inclusive of fit for market products and data enabled solutions that meet market specific economic and application requirements. Whilst we're, we are a 100 year old diesel company, we are very excited about the future. This is especially true in the convergence, I think in two areas, clean energy prime mover solutions, which, we, which we, we've heard about, and the use of real, real world, real time, real life cycle data um, from the products that we already have in the field. So like, like all of us, I think, you know, over the past several years, we've ramped up our investment in emerging hydrogen and electrical technologies. And just to give you a couple of examples, um, in 2017, we acquired the Johnson Matthey high voltage battery business, um, which kind of enabled us into the, um, or, or helped us in, in a way substitute ourselves in, in the on, on highway powertrain. And then we also acquired Bramo's low voltage battery business, which was more akin to a lot of Cummins off highway products and how we how we substitute our, our diesel presence in, in those markets. And then in 2019, we acquired Hydrogenics fuel cell and hydrogen electrolyzer business. At the same time, we have more than 250,000 connected vehicles around the world, providing our teams with hundreds of gigabytes of data every day. This real time understanding of our customers in a way that the job to be done by them is helping us tailor product performance, improve uptime and develop predictive maintenance service plans. It also allows us to develop more realistic simulation tools that enable us to iterate many products and designs digitally, um, ultimately improving the performance of our next generation of product releases, whether they be diesel, natural gas, electric or fuel cell. Along with our existing capabilities in traditional commercial vehicle technology and system integration, we believe that investments like this are necessary for us to maintain and extend our leadership position in the prime mover space. You know, recognizing the, the, you know, the point ju just made in terms of the, 
the time, you know, it's still, it's still a time we see between the, the, the true zero emission future, which we think will take around 20 years um, to, to fully realize. So thank you for inviting me today and I look forward to, to the remainder of the day. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, next, um, we have Professor Hua Zhao, who is also a committee member of uh, UKC SAE. Um, so Professor Zhao is a fellow of Royal Academy of Engineering and fellow of SAE. Uh, he was the chairman of Powertrain Systems and Fuse Group of the Army Key, and the chief scientist of the National Key Program on Internal Combustion Engines uh, in China. Professor Zhao. Uh, okay, let me share my screen first. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, can you see my screen now? Yep, I can see you now. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tang, for your kind introduction. And uh, I'm pleased that um, I I'm speaking after Dr. Mike Bass's uh, uh, introduction to the roles of IC engines and uh, uh, hybrid vehicles. Uh, so today I'm going to share with you some uh, thought on the future engines and uh, their fuels. I borrowed this one from a very recent um, uh, presentation at the Department of Energy in US. I think this was in June. Um, from this uh, graph, you can see uh, even by 2040 or even 2050, the global, this is only light duty, uh, doesn't include heavy duty, majority of the vehicles will still have internal combustion engines, whether as a, a mild hybrid plug-in um, so majority of the vehicles will still have IC engines. So that's the first message I want to share with you, which I completely agree. The second point is uh, if you look at, well, well, you may ask why. The reason is uh, obviously for commercial vehicles, we know the battery is uh, really not suitable for long range and heavy duty vehicle applications. And if you have a 20, uh, 40 ton truck, you need to carry 20 ton battery. This doesn't make sense. But if you look across the whole spectrum, the battery electric vehicles, they are well suited for short distance and um, uh, uh, inner city driving. But as you move towards to the left, where you travel longer, you need to carry more weight, then you need to rely on high power density energy source, in this case, whether it's gas or liquid, uh, lots of uh, the future of uh, 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 IC engines. Then there are three questions. First, can IC engines be carbon neutral and zero emission if uh, they're going to uh, uh, stay? And what will be the role of IC engines in the low carbon vehicle. I don't like new energy because the fuel cells and electric vehicles, they were before internal combustion engines. So there's nothing new. Uh, although we have adopted that terminology for the sake of it. Um, and then finally, what is the state of the art IC engines and what are the potentials? Okay, if you talk to people and even in the press, people say engines produce CO2. That's what people's uh, 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 impression. If you burn fossil fuels, carbon fuels will produce CO2. Now, there are a lot of interest now in hydrogen. Okay, if you put hydrogen in the engine, it doesn't produce CO2. So it's not the engine produce CO2, it's what you put into the engine. Finally, if you look at life cycle, there are also ways where you can produce fuel from renewable energy whether it's hydrogen or even liquid fuel, like methanol and ethanol. Again, if you look at life cycle, they produce almost no CO2. So the question is, is uh, the CO2 is produced by burning fossil fuels, not because engine produce CO CO2. I think that's another message I want to emphasize. And we, uh, I think Dr. Uh, Mike Bassett mentioned about the plug-in or hybrid uh, electric vehicles. Uh, that will be the future, at least for the next 20, 30 years. 
but in any case, you still have IC engine. And for those who are working on IC engine would recognize this uh, fuel consumption map. Uh, the IC engine typically has um, a region where the fuel consumption is optimum. Uh, when you deviate from this region, then the fuel consumption will increase. But by combining the uh, electric motors and batteries with uh, IC engines, in fact, you can optimize the engine to operate in the most uh, minimum fuel consumption region. And also you can increase the efficiency because you don't have to design the engine to operate over so many different speed and load range. And um, at Brunel, I'm very pleased to say uh, Dr. Xinyan Wang has won a very prestigious UKRI Future Leaders Fellow uh, ship. And uh, he is going to lead, uh, lead a research over the next four years to look at the use of hydrogen in liquid fuel for both road and marine and aerospace applications. And we call this nano fuel. In parallel, we're going to develop high efficiency engine and uh, combined electric generators for the hybrid applications. Now, if you look at uh, the uh, potential, the state of the art of IC engines, uh, this is uh, reported by Mazda a couple of years ago. They were able to realize a indicated thermal efficiency of 56% for a light duty single cylinder engine running on gasoline. And put that in context, the best engine in production, the road vehicles has a high thermal efficiency about 41, 42%. Okay, so that's very significant uh, uh, improvement. And in fact, the most efficient engines in production or gasoline engine in production, which has a 45% thermal efficiency or even higher, and with a power density over 250, uh, 240 kilowatts per liter, is this engine. Some of you would recognize. And this is the Formula One engine. And this engine runs with lean and uh, some kind of uh, um, advanced combustion technologies. In the case of uh, diesel, uh, I borrowed this slide from uh, uh, Daimler. They report this in June uh, this year as part of DOE project. They, ha they have already realized a 52.9% brake thermal efficiency. So their target is 55% thermal efficiency in the next two or three years. And people say, oh, what's the future of powertrain and the fuels? Obviously, we have a crystal ball. We can play with the crystal ball, but I don't think we can rely on the crystal ball. But this is my wish. Some of you may recognize this. Even back in the uh, 50s, this was proposed. And this is um, a Ford nuclear-powered uh, nuclear concept car back in 1958. I think that's the future. If we can have a, a nuclear powered vehicle, then we don't have to worry about the emissions and the CO2 whatsoever, but it has to be uh, fusion, not uh, uh, fission uh, for safety reasons. So we have to keep on waiting. And also there are a lot of interest in taking the cars in the sky. Uh, that's uh, another future development for, uh, for cars or vehicles. Thank you very much. That's my very short presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhao. Uh, that's a very clear picture for the future of the powertrain system. And next we'll have a few um, leaders from the Chinese uh, OEMs. Uh, the first one will be Mr. Jincheng Li from uh, FAW. Uh, Mr. Li will deliver his speech in Chinese. Uh, he is responsible for advanced R&D and development of passenger car engines and fuel cell. Now he's leading the development of FAW fourth generation engine development, focusing on efficiency, combustion concepts, uh, electrification and digitization. And uh, now I'll uh, hand it over to you, Mr. Li. Okay. 大家上午好. 
，呃，我是李金成，呃，在一期负责传统内燃机和燃料电池的研发工作，呃，非常有非常高兴，呃，借这个机会和呃同行进行呃一些交流，分享一些观点。呃，在一期呢，我是负责呃，刚才讲过内燃机和燃料电池，呃，那么内燃机呢，大家都知道，呃，这些年有呃呃非常强的杀死内燃机的声音，呃，这是一个方面啊、呃，因为内燃机的有二氧化碳排放，还有其呃其他的排放，呃，而另外一个方面呢，我又负责燃料电池的研发，那么燃料电池呢，呃。由于它成本比较高，另外一个缺少基础设施，那么大到现在大家都认为燃料电池离市场还是比较远的，呃，所以呃很多时候呃我们都感觉到呃无论是内燃机也好，还是燃燃料电池也好，我们都处于一个呃非常尴尬的一个境地。但是从另一方面来讲，内燃机。仍然是主流的汽车公司的挣钱机器，也是呃我们市场大多数客户的首选，就购车的首选。因为到目前为止，呃内燃机汽车仍然是成本效益是最佳的。呃，从长远来看呢，燃料电池汽车呢，呃又是最理想的。呃，终极的汽车动力。当然了，我们呃为此还要克服很多困难，特别是成本的困难以及基础设施的困难。今天我们的主题是新能源和数字化。呃，但是在这里呢，呃，我也我非常想呃强调一点，就是说没有一个技术。是高贵的，就是没有一个技术比另外一个技术是更高贵的。我们只能用市场或者是客户来评价这最终的技术。任何政府的激励政策，就对特殊的技术路线的激励政策，将会对总体的技术技术路线产生扭扭曲。激励政策只能。集中于研发和开发，不能对产业和工业、对市场进行激励。我们应该，呃，基于从油井到车轮的概念来评价二氧化碳排放。呃，一些人一直认为，呃，内燃机是呃新能源和数字化的敌人，但是我们。认为内燃机和新能源以及数字化应该是合作伙伴。呃，内燃机和数字化与新能源结合后，可以进一步减少二氧化碳排放以及有有害气体排放。呃，就正如刚才呃赵豪博士讲的，随着我们内燃机的效率在未来达到百分之四十五以及百分之五十，啊，通过混合动力化汽车的混合动力化，我们会呃实现。呃，内燃机的近零排放，或者是双零排放，所以说，我们叫在一期我们叫这种新的内燃机，就是我们在把传统的内燃机就 internal combustion engine 转换为 intended combustion engine with e drive and e fuel， 所以说未来我们新概念内燃机将为行业提供一个解决方案。是，而不是一个污染的造成者。So the new ICE will be part of solution, not part of pollution. 谢谢大家。Thank you, thank you,、uh, Mr. Lee.、Um, again, that's a very clear direction、uh, of the、uh, power tank system in the future.、Uh, next, we have Dr. Zheng Xu,、uh, director director at、uh, SEAC. Uh, Dr. Xu will talk about the future of powertrain system、um, and the challenges as well. So it's going to be very interesting,、uh, Dr. Xu. 
Respectful Professor Xu Hongmi, respectful guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Xu Zhen from Segmotor Technical Center. First, I would like to thank Professor Xu Hongmi for inviting me to attend this、uh, annual conference hosted by UK Chinese Society of Automotive Engineers. So that I have this opportunity to meet all participants from both UK and China. Although the coronavirus pandemic has slowed down the travels and face-to-face meetings, the technological advancement still enables us to communicate across the world closely. As you all know, the automotive industry is in great transformation towards the future of mobility. And the journey is full of challenges. For example, the regulatory requirements on vehicle fuel consumptions and pollutant emissions are becoming more stringent for the purpose of environment protections and carbon emission reductions. While consumers' expectations of dynamic response from the driving experience are still on the rise without any sign of compromise. In the meantime, the long-term trend towards electric mobility also poses significant challenges to the traditional dominant role of the conventional powertrain with combustion engines. So OEMs and engineers around the world are exploring the roadmap to the right powertrain that meet all the requirements for various driving scenarios and in different markets. When we are to protect the climate and reduce air pollution on a global scale in a sustainable way, more and more data start to indicate that both electrification of the conventional powertrain and the battery electric powertrain need to coexist for meeting all types of mobility requirements. There is、uh, no single one solution. Similarly, the challenges. For the connectivity and intelligent driving, are no less severe in this time of great transformation of the whole automotive industry. The situation, in my mind, requires us to be more quick response and in faster pace. But more importantly, it also presents us with great opportunities to develop much more innovative concepts and solutions, since the passenger car. Has become a carrier for the unlimited imaginations, and the technological innovation is the same of this era. There are certainly differences between UK market and China market. The transformation and the challenges we are facing, however, are common since it is in global scale. Therefore, it is more important than ever before. That the communications and collaborations across the continent naturally needs to be enhanced. The annual conference by UK CSAE provides an excellent platform for professionals from UK and China to communicate and workshop directly on extended topics. For example, the two topics in this year's conference. Virtual de- product development and new energy vehicle development are the focal points in the industry right now. So the conference serves the need very well. Lastly, I would like to thank the organizing committee for their great efforts and wish a very successful conference. Thank you. Okay. And、um, next we have、uh, Dr. Shermin Zhang、uh, from Dongfeng Motor Corporation.、Uh, Dr. Zhang has spent over ten years studying and working in Japan before joining Dongfeng Motor Corporation in、uh, 2010.、Uh, he has been in charge of chassis department and powertrain department, including hybridization and electrification.、Uh, he is chairman of gasoline engine committee. Uh, chief of Gasoline Engine and Chief of、uh, Strategic Platform C, and Dr. Zhang、uh, is with me now.
呃，大家好，我是来自于东风汽车集，呃嗯，我是来自于东风汽车集团技术中心张世明，呃，很高兴啊，徐徐教授的邀请来参加这个中英的这个工程师的一个一个交流。我希望把我这些工作的一些情况呢，和大家进行一个呃交流和和分享。首先呢，刚才也感谢啊，嗯，主持人对我的介绍。呃，我实际上是，嗯，从那个大学毕业以后呢，就去日本留学，然后呢，在日本工作了十年，大陆汽车工作十年以后呢，回到了东风汽车集团，呃，做底盘和汽车动力这方面。那么现在对这个各主机厂作为主机厂呢，跟大家分享一下一些信息吧。那么首先呢。呃，介绍一下那个电动车的一些现状吧。啊，在中国市场上呢，从今年开始呢，实际电动车呢已经慢慢的已经有所热动了，有所减弱。呃，嗯 ，FCV 呢，就是氢氢能源呢，包括混动啊，呃，还有智能化、网联化呢，这个在中国市场已经慢慢的开始兴起了。那么在这种情况下呢？呃，国家呢已经开始提倡，也就是说，以前把混动，就是 HEV 这个车呢，呃，也作为一个未来的一个方向。所以现在各个车厂呢正在研究混动汽车的一个方向，以前是不作为新能源汽车的，这是一个大方向。所以目前呢，各个车厂呢都在进行这一方面的研究。那么东风也不例外。呃，我们从电动化的角度来说，在动力总成方面呢。引入了一些电动化的概念，也在做发动机传统能源的呃这个研究。那么发动机呢，对我们来说目前有两个研究方向，一个是从拥抱电动车方面，我们做混动的专用的内燃机；另外一方面呢，我们在高效内燃机方面呢，我们也在做工作。所以内燃机呢，目前来看呢，我们就是在两个方向在做。那么东风呢，目前呢。我们做的呃状况呢是这样的，就是说我们应对了这个国六或者未来的国七呢，我们已经开发出在市场上啊很具有竞争力的发动机。我们刚刚呃嗯马上要量产的，就是有一有一款一点五升的增压直喷发动机。这个发动机呢大概有两个版本，一个叫动力版本，它的升功率是一一百零二千瓦。蒸馏距是217牛米，那么 1.5 升里边呢，它可以达到1百0一百五千瓦和320牛米这样的一个功率。同时呢，我们有一个高，呃，刚刚嗯得到了嗯中国嗯、呃、就是汽车呃检测中心天津检测中心检测，我们的热效率呢可以达到 71.07%。目前呢，从热效率和动力性方面来看，我们这个发动机应该是一个在中国市场就在已经是到一个比较领先的水平。当然了，这也和我们东风汽车这个团队，呃呃，研发团队呢非常相关的。我们的研发团队比较年轻，同时呢，我们也应用了一些行业上最先进的、可变的这些技术，比如 VVT 啊、可变机油泵啊。同时呢，我们还用了一些很先进的呃降摩擦以及热管理方面比较新的一些技术。可能有些技术呢，可能在中国市场上是第一次使用的，比如说 EGR 呀，还有双层油几何呀等等一些技术，所以才使得我们这个发动机呢达到了这样一个水平。那么也就是今天给大家分享这些呢，也就是介绍大家介绍一下，也就是我们传统动力或者内燃机方面呢。从节能和减减少排放方面呢，大家可能也有很多学者也也有一些研究吧。其实也跟电动车相比，从全生命周期的碳排放，我们包括我们在日本的一些呃研究学者所得到的结论是不差上下了。如果我的我们的内燃机效率达到四十五的话，将来可以和现在的同等的呃电动车。是相同的二氧二氧化碳的排放，所以呢
呃，今天呢给大家交流这些呢，就希望中国市场是一个很活跃的市场，也希望呃和英国的工程师们呃们一起呢，我们一起来把中国市场做强做大，然后呢，也希望大家呢进行进一步的合作和交流。嗯、呃，大使得我们的汽车呢，应该是像中国的别的产品一样遍布全球。谢谢大家。Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. John. Uh, so far, we've had um, many technical presentations and um, um, ideas. And next, we will have uh, some insights from the uh, market perspective and the general uh, strategies. So we'll have Ms. Tina Zhou, uh, CEO and founder of Gasco International, chief editor of Gasco. Uh, before uh, the establishment of Gasco International, Tina Zhou worked at the joint procurement platform between Chara Auto and Brilliant Auto with more than 10 years of uh, experience in the automotive industry. Uh, now, Ms. Zhou. Okay, I'm guessing that's how we have our presentation. Yeah. 起来 ，OK。呃 ，We can see your folder. Slides, can you see slides? 呃、uh, ，看不到您的这个 PPT， 那、啊、这个文件夹，可以吗？现在可以吗？那、uh,。还是看的是文件夹，这个呢，播放也不行吗？呃，还是不行。呃，执行你那边有这个咱们的 PPT 吗？或者说，就是因为你那个需要屏幕的时候，在前面选择选当前屏幕。啊，现在可以了。当前屏。现在可以吗？可以吧。OK， yeah。OK， 好，那我抓紧时间。呃，我给大家分享的是中国市场的这个情况啊，因为时间有限，我就过得快一点。那首先呢，我们看到中国的经济呢，其实在这个呃处理，就是 Q1 处理之后呢，呃，已经进入了快速的反弹期，特别是八月份之后，中国的这个消费指数明显上来，所以我们每个月的这个中国市场的销量一直在超预期。尤其目前在中国非常明显的是这个区域经济的一体化，现在带动了整体的这个内循环。那中国提出的这个双呃新基建和内循环呢，作为现在我们说呃经济发展的新的引擎，应该已经逐步释放出了新的效应。呃，所以围绕这个长三角的都市圈、港澳的都市圈，还有京津冀和成渝，现在都爆发出了相对比较大的这个消费能力，呃，有一波新的这个市场契机在兴起。然后各个的这个地方政府其实也陆续出台了比较明比较多的这个消费刺激政策。那大家知道，就是两天前上海市政府关于这个，呃，限牌限行的政策，那预计就在上海单单一的这个市场应该会带来近十万的这个市场销量，尤其是对新能源车的这个拉动是比较明显的。那我们还看到呢，就是，嗯，刚刚的这个 A C E C C E 的年会啊，嗯，做了这个二点零的。整个的节能的一个一个路线图的一个规划。那汽车产业呢，在中国被视为制造强国的重要支撑。呃，政府针对产业发展方向、市场目标和核心技术呢，应该来讲已经提出了相对比较明确的目标，尤其是在新能源和混动的这个领域，给大家吃的一个比较大的这个定心丸。呃，我们看到这个节能汽车和新能源在未来的这个市场销量中间，它的份额应该会增长比较大，特别是新能源汽车。呃，二零三五年将会占到百分之五十以上，那其中百分之九十五的新能源车将会是纯电，剩余的部分全部在混混动技术，所以呢，混动会成为现在在中国市场上车企的这个主要选择过渡方案。然后在整个市场的品牌上，我们可以看到呢，中国乘用车的市场，嗯、呃，不断在向优势品牌集中，所以在自主车企中间，现在的这个吉利、长安。呃，上汽、长城、广汽、比亚迪基本上是属于叫第一的这个梯队，那整个的这个份额呢是，嗯，比较比较聚集。那当然也有一些弱势品牌，呃，今年的这个这两年应该是属于大大洗牌的过程
。那另外一点呢，可以看到，当经济下滑和市场不太好的时候，其实日系车呃非常的抗跌。所以像丰田作为日系的头部企业呢，涨势强于其他日系品牌。其他的豪华车，豪华车品牌今年的表现非常抢眼。呃，主要也通过了一些这种降价的这个手段来进行了这个市场的这个引领。那我们还可以看到，就是在豪华车和合资品牌的正面冲击上呢，嗯、呃，自主品牌都提出了向上的这个发展方向。比如像上，比如像东风推的这个蓝图，呃，上汽推的 L 品牌，都是继长城推位，呃，吉利推领克，大家都是想着怎么能够把品牌的竞争力在网上持续提升。那豪华车品牌在中国呢，目前的市场方向的策略主要是以价换量，嗯，价格的下探区间应该对整体的这个市场挤压是比较大的。那在新造车势力的这一波的浪潮里面， 2 0 2 0年应该来讲是一个非常大的分水岭。我们可以看到新造车势力的这个头部企业，呃，未来理想、小鹏、威马，那么在通过融资、通过新的产品交付，基本上呢。嗯，已经跑出了这个头羊的态势。那在中间有一大波的企业呢，实际上量产的交付难关是比较，呃、嗯，比较难过的。同时的资金呢，也受到很大的这个冲击。呃，另外呢，就是在中国的这个市场下降策略呢，应该会提升新能源的这个市场发展。我们看新能源的销量，其实在北线，呃，一二一二三线的这个城市，它是渗透率大概在百分之六，但四线以下呢，仅为百分之二。所以可以看到，比呃宏光呃五菱宏光 mini EV 的这个销量涨得非常快，主要是聚焦在这个领域的细分市场切割。那从整体上来看呢，呃我们预计就是说，呃中国的这个市场销量呢，应该整体今年如果好的话，呃大概会在负的这个百分之六到八，呃百呃百分之百分之六。然后呢，如果是 positive 来看的话，应该有有望能够控制在负的百分之二之间。然后，乘用车市场电气化的占比呢，将会逐年提升，混动技术会成为车企的这个重要选择。好的，那我的分享就到这里，谢谢大家。Thank you,、uh, thank you, Miss Joe.、Uh, we've seen a lot of、uh, challenges, but more importantly, a lot of good news from、uh, the market side.、Uh, and personally, I'm much happier now.、Um, uh, and next,、uh, we'll have four、uh, guest speakers. Uh, from very important associations that UK CSA works very closely with.、Uh, first,、uh, we'll have Professor Jiang Guo Lin,、uh, President of Association of British Chinese Professors. Professor Lin. Okay, thanks very much for the chairman for your introduction.、Uh, in the meantime, I'm professor at Imperial College as well. Um, probably many people still do not know ABCP yet. This is <coughs> association of British Chinese professors, which uh, include about uh, over five hundred full professors at the universe、uh, at UK universities, and also include many associate members, which are not yet reached to the professor level yet. And、uh, firstly, I would like to congratulate and、uh, your first one years old for your society, and uh, which is uh, uh, bring uh, automotive people together from UK, China, and、uh, also working in the other areas as well. I personally am not working on automotive, but、uh, we work on the zero emissions and、uh, how to achieve this as well. And、recently, we have got two big uh, uh, program project with the、uh, EPSRC. One is called UK Fire. In this project, we launched a document to achieve zero emissions in 2050. Automotive is big sector we are looking at as well. <clears throat> And another project, UK uh, program uh, uh, EPSRC program project. Which is called、uh, light form. We try to use light alloys in vehicles, which can reduce the weight of vehicles. Over the many years, and、uh, <clears throat> over this period, and you can see about uh, uh, vehicles' weight has been increased significantly. In last forty years, in average, the vehicle weight has been increased by fifty percent. 
even if we try to reduce the weight significantly. And uh, <clears throat> the reason is that people like to drive big cars. And for big cars have got large margins, you can make more money and uh, for manufacturers, for uh, that's, uh, again, the customer like big cars. That's why the car becomes bigger and bigger and heavier and heavier. But our job to reduce the weight and uh, we try to use the light, lightweight materials to re reduce the weight of vehicles. We did some estimations for uh, petrol or en for en uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. If we can, we could reduce the weight by 50% for body and chassis structures, which could reduce, uh, reduce CO2 emissions by about uh, 25, uh, 28 to 30%. For electric cars, we can extend the travel range by 30%. And uh, there are a long way to go, but uh, anyway, what we try to do is to reduce the weight of vehicles to contribute for the zero emissions in 2050 in the UK and the world as well. And uh, finally, I would like to congratulate again for your uh, society, for our society, which has been reached for one year anniversary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Lin. Uh, next, we have Dr. Shicheng Zhang uh, from uh, uh, Association of Chinese Mechanical and Electrical Engineers in Germany. Um, Dr. Zhang. Hey, 你好, uh, 大家好, 这个非常感谢, 英国同事邀请我参加这次活动, 你们这次活动的主题和内容都非常好, 我在这里代表在德国工作的数以千计的华人工程师吧, 另外一个呢，我刚才呃听到，就是过两天吧，你们学你们协会是成立一周年，借此机会呢，我们也表示衷心的祝贺，同时希望我们加强这个UK和欧洲大陆的合作。好，谢谢大家，再见。Thank you, Dr. Chang, and uh, I I also uh, look forward to our cooperation in the future as well. Uh, next, we have Dr. Shan Jin Wang, uh, President of Association of Chinese Engineers of uh, Automobile in France. Uh, uh, Wang Shan Jin, uh, uh, so Wang 呃，我们的协会的主要的活动嘛，主要也是组织这个，除了这个会员之间的交流之外啊，也是组织这个呃有关汽车方面的讲座，然后再跟呃汽车呃那个企业，中国中国企业和法国企业啊进行交流合作，呃，再一个就是跟其他的兄弟协会啊进行交流和合作，那么今年呢就是。呃，我们跟这个欧洲的四大协会啊，进行了非常好的这个合作，呃，就是借助于这这个今年十月底在上海召开的全球华人汽车呃精英呃联合年会，呃，我们这个欧洲协会啊、呃，这个由这个啊、呃、张世成这个呃主席这个带带头啊，我们欧洲协会是这个。这个今年这个年会，上海年会的这个主办方啊，我们共同策划了这个今年的年会，非常非常成功啊！我特别想强调的是，今年就是我们四个协会一起做了一件非常了不起的事情啊！我们这个一块呃撰写了这个欧洲汽车蓝皮书，就是献给这个中国呃今年这个这个上海这个全球华人汽车精英联合年会的这这本书，我们就是从今年六月份开始。
，呃，我们花了三个月的时间，那个我们就我们这个四个协会，呃，一块合作的非常非常的好，呃，那个这个这个这个英国的呃协会呢也做了很大的贡献，这个特别是啊，唐华颖呃秘书长啊本人就是负责了这个我们这个这个。呃，南皮书的其中的一张，这个呃，徐宏明主席还为我们这个南皮书啊，亲自为我们南皮书设计了非常漂亮的那个那个那个南南皮书的这个书面，所以呃，非常感谢啊，非常感谢这个呃英国协会的合作和支持，呃，我希望就是我们以后这个我们跟英国协会啊，跟其他的协会，我们继续合作。啊，再继续呃，做出更更更更更好、更更有有益的这个这个这这个为汽车方方面做出做出呃贡献。呃，再次祝贺英国这个全英华人汽车工程师协会年会召开，哎，祝贺呃年会圆满成功。Thank you, Dr. Wang.、Uh, it has been a great pleasure working with you and the other、uh, associations from、uh, European countries.、Uh, lastly, we have Dr.、Uh, Junwei Jiang,、uh, President of Promotion Association for Scientific and Technical Cooperation between Austria and China.、Uh, Dr. Jiang. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Dear guests, dear speakers, hello. I am very happy to be here. 应邀参加二零二零全英华人汽车工程师协会年会。首先，呃，请允许我代表奥地利澳中科技交流协会，对全英华人汽车工程师协会的顺利召开表示衷心的祝贺，向各位与会嘉宾、来宾和全英华英华人汽车工程师协会的全体会员致以亲切的问候。问候。现在，科学发展促使。正在向信息化、网络化、数字化和智能化的方向发展，汽车行业也不例外。数字化、网络化、智能化汽车和新能源汽车，成为了汽车领域新的发展方向，受到世界各国的重视。感谢全英华人汽车工程师协会年会这个平台，让大家有机会在这里互相交流、互相学习。共同探讨汽车领域的新技术和新发展，开阔视野，面向未来。相信通过这样的平台，一定能够让大家增进了解和沟通，得到启迪和收获，促进相互之间的交流与合作。最后，祝二零二零全英华人汽车工程师协会年会圆满成功。谢谢大家。Thank you very much. Thank you all for the remarkable speech, and a special thanks to Ms. Xu Wei Luo from Jiangling Motor Company, the director of Powertrain Engineering Department,、um, China Radio International, China Central Television, Xinhua News Agency, China News Service, Novel de Rob, the Chinese Weekly, UK Chinese Journals. Chinese Business Gazette. A special thanks to all of our very honourable guests who take their time off their schedule and to be here with us. So the next one would be the outlook of UK CSE.、Uh, before we go into this, there are small update about our agenda. The panel discussion will start by a little bit after eleven. So there will be four parts in this. It's about organisation, the members. Achievements we have in 2020 and future developments. So now,、um, let me introduce to、uh, to our co-host, Dr. Huang Yintang. Right.、Uh, thank you. Next page, please. And I'll just very quickly go through.、Uh, this is a map that was、uh, created last year, showing the distribution of our members in the UK.、Uh, we currently have around 400 members, and it covers a wide. A、uh, range of geographic locations and various types of organisations. And the next slide、uh, will be showing the list of、uh, the UK CSE committee members. And you can see that we are coming from、uh, different backgrounds. 
and uh, we constantly seek uh, ways to help our, uh, our members. And uh, in order to understand more about our uh, members, um, Dr. Xunzhe Zhang did a uh, very extensive survey and report uh, to show who we have uh, in the UK CSAE. Hello, um, Dr. Xunzhe Zhang, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting this on behalf of her. So early this year, we carried out a survey on registered and potential members and the purpose for doing this one is a sketching profile of them and to understand the professional development needs and hear their expectations on the society. So we can organize the future events with more Pacific goals. Uh, we collected data on questionnaires and interviews, and the questionnaire circulated via social media like WeChat groups formed by Chinese automotive professional co professionals currently or previously based in UK. So 85 of them have been registered as member, and the rest have not yet. At the same time, uh, we recruited seven volunteers for interviews and then uh, ranging from PhD students to experienced engineers to understand individual about professional development expectations. Um, from the start, first of all, our member generally have higher academic qualifications. Nearly 60% of them passed a PhD. One third have, have got master degrees. Regarding to their employer type, 43% of the sample works in vehicle manufacturers or suppliers. 15% are employed by consultancies and 24% um, of them are academic at UK universities. In respect of the job type, 57 of the participants works in industrial R&Ds, uh, research and development centers, including car companies and engineering consultancies. 19% of them have an uh, academic, uh, academic job and, the new, and a few new job roles are technical sales, business development, project management, and so on. So we're actually activating two dimensions. First, the participants have working knowledge in the areas like hybrid electric powertrain in which half of them have been involved. Uh, internal combustion engine control system, transmission and uh, draft run, thermal management, etc. And additional, a few of them have expertise in autonomous vehicles. The other dimension in the recent development skills they have had. Uh, more than half of the sample has been experienced in such as modeling and simulation, testing, uh, validation, or optimization. Apart from their professional profile above, this survey also wanted to understand what professionals supposed they expected to get from the society. So we designed a chat box question to address this. The top three most frequency tick items are to keep update the industry communication and the collaboration opportunities between the UK and China, and to keep updates on the state of art a future trend in UK industry and to keep updated the state of art, the future trend in Chinese industry. We can see they are especially able to keep updated in Chinese auto industry and the network between UK and China, which may distinguish the society from others. So future events echo this recommendation uh, are listed over here, and then we will get it involved in probably a little bit of future program. Let's see next page, please. So what we did this year, one of the challenges we are having this year is coronavirus. As an overseas Chinese association, we raised over 3,000 pounds to help Wuhan in that period of time and purchase and develop potato suits to the frontline medical professionals in Wuhan and that and then via the platform organized by um, Association of British China, Chinese Professors. A big thanks to everyone who supports this activity. We organized two uh, webinars and for, with Dr. Ni Xuan Li from Frontline Wuhan Wuchang Hospital and, and Professor Xin Wang from you know, University of Manchester to give us speeches about prevention COVID-19 in March. We received 7,000 marks from Embassy of China and top talent. Thank you very much. So this is about moving story. 
is uh, found um, about we're all helping each other. So when China, Wuhan needs need us, we help them and when we need help, they help us. Uh, the, they, they just helped us directly. A special thanks to um, our West President, Dr. Chen Xinglin and his wife. The black circle on this map is actually how they delivered uh, the max to everyone, so uh, most the main points in UK. So uh, let's go to, as, as Xunzhou, Dr. Xunzhou Zhang suggested, we did have um, seven technical webinars um, which involved uh, have 11 guest speakers, over 800 minutes and over 1300 attendees. And then the topics are widely covered as the picture or the color was <clears throat> showing on right hand side. So let me give it back to um, Hua Yu. Okay, thank you, Shuru. And now um, just a little bit of uh, about our future plans. Uh, at very high level, when we set up this organization, we aim to provide support uh, and platforms for our members uh, to collaborate with other organizations and to promote cooperation and networking between the automotive industries in China, UK, and other countries as well. Uh, we will provide uh, career development support um, to our members, which will include, uh, for example, coaching systems within UK CSEE and professional trainings from, for example, uh, Changeway Project Management. Uh, we also have our uh, WeChat uh, official account on the next page. Um, and this has a very high impact uh, in the industry, uh, very wide uh, coverage, um, as you can see from numbers. Uh, we will continue to use this platform to share our uh, expertise. Uh, we could also have, uh, for example, interviews and other programs on here as well. So please uh, do follow us. And we are also working with our friends uh, in other European countries, uh, together with the associations from Germany, France, and Austria. We will be delivering joint uh, online webinars uh, and this particular annual conference we're having today uh, marks the first of these sessions. And moreover, we have jointly written a collection of technical articles, and this will be shared with the members very soon. Um, in addition, uh, we have supported and been involved in many uh, Chinese companies visit to the UK, including, for example, Beijing Automotive Industry Holding Group. Um, we have also worked with UK companies such as uh, Cambustion. Uh, we will continue to work with uh, organizations uh, from UK, China, and other countries. Of course, uh, all of these will be based on the support we receive from uh, the members, uh, the committee of UK CSAE, as well as uh, other organizations. So thank you very much uh, in advance and very much appreciated. And the next part of today's conference will be a panel discussion around the digitization in automotive industry. And Dr. Chun Xing Lin and Dr. Ran Bao will be the moderators for that session.